Okay, so my topic, uh, motor learning in, in ACL rehab. Uh, I think we need to ask ourselves, what, what, what is motor learning? And uh, do, we, do we really need it for, for ACL rehab? And uh, aren't we doing it already? So Ali, what's, what's the benefit of your talk? Well, why do we need this? Well, uh, first we need to talk about what do we mean by motor learning? And I, I want to highlight the, the two most important ones. The first one is obviously, if you want to learn something, you have to practice. The fourth one, and that's, I think the most important one is learning means that when you practice something, you uh, reach an improvement in your motor skills. You can only say that you really learn something when it leads to uh, relatively permanent changes. So your effect of learning have sustained over time. That's crucial. So that's very important because what you see during uh, your physical therapy sessions is nothing more than a performance measure, which is different than learning. So you may have a patient that is performing not well, and you may think there is no learning going on, but you don't know that. Conversely, if a patient is performing the exercise well, it does not automatically imply that a lot of motor learning takes place. So you really need to differentiate performance and learning. And this is my mandatory slide. So the people that have seen my presentations already before, uh, this is a good time to take a break and get something to eat or to drink. For those others, just take around five or 10 seconds to ask yourself, how did you learn how to ride a bicycle when you were a little kid? How did it happen? How did you practice? And it could be something like this, right? So you were practicing with your father or mother and you were wearing, uh, using a bike with uh, small and big wheels, uh, training wheels on the side. And basically you just practiced. Now, if you would try to explain to me in words how you ride a bicycle, and try to practice that after this presentation, but I guarantee you, it will be very difficult for you to put in words how you ride the bicycle. How do you do that? But what do we do in physiotherapy? So we provide a lot of instructions and a lot of feedback with the premise that this is all the information that the patient needs to learn motor skills. And is that so? Is that true? What, do you, what does the evidence say about this? And coming back to, to motor learning, I have talked about the definitions, but also what are the different motor principles? Well, there are many out there. There are many out there. And for the purpose of this presentation, I want to focus on, on, uh, on just two. I think that is much more worthwhile that I do something more into depth than addressing uh, them all uh, separately. So the first one is the attentional focus. And here we go again, because there are a lot, a lot of misconceptions going on. It seems like motor learning is, is getting a little bit on vogue, but there is also with that development, there is also a, a huge a uh, range of uh, descriptions and definitions going around. And that's, that's really troublesome because that makes it hard for us to discuss with one another. Because as you can see here, uh, we use things like uh, externally focused motivation, external cueing, external focus of control. So we first need to have a common sense of what we actually talk about. And uh, just to highlight this, uh, this study in, uh, about an evidence-based statement, and here the statement was made that patients should start with an internal focus instruction by the, provided by the therapist to achieve sound movement patterns. Well, it's a statement, but really this is not substantiated by a lot of uh, science because actually the science tells us the, uh, the opposite that athletes and patients do not need internal focus instructions. They uh, do much better if they have uh, sustained, uh, have used uh, external focus instructions. So how, how does this work? Well, and what is this, what is the true definition for an external focus instruction? Well, it's actually rather simple. It's an athlete who's target, targeting his or her attention on the outcome or the effect of the movement. 
So what you want to do as a therapist or an athletic trainer, you want your athlete to focus on the task of the goal. That is the most accepted and uh, uh, the definition on, uh, on uh, external focus put forward by the work of uh, Gabriella Wolf and, and colleagues. Subsequently, there is less focus on your internal body movements and that's what would be uh, defined as an, as an internal focus. Here, an example, if you want to teach your athlete uh, how to do a squat, you can give them internal focus instructions like bend your hips, bend your knees, keep your knees over the toes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What I'm doing here on the right side is providing the athlete with an external focus cue, reach for the cones. That's my external focus. So he has a, he has a pretty straightforward talk and I'm not telling him how he needs to do it. And that's a crucial uh, uh, distinction from an internal focus. In an external focus, you allow for self-organization of your athlete, how they complete the task. I come back later to you about what, if, what happens if the patient is not performing as you would like it. And that's, that's something I'll talk about later when we talk about feedback. Does it work, that external focus? Well, um, we did some research on that, and here you can see an example on the knee kinematics uh, during a jump landing task. And uh, on the left side, on the flexion initial contact, you see the difference in knee flexion at initial contact with a group that received internal focus instructions compared to a group that received external focus instructions. You can get around 12 degrees extra knee flexion on initial contact if you just change a few words, because that's all it takes. From internal to external usually means only changing a few words, and that's what you can see here. The same results were also achieved for peak knee flexion, and also here you see that patients had larger peak knee flexion in the external focus group compared to internal. And again, it's just by changing a few words. Well, jumping is one thing. What about more advanced skills? Here uh, you see in a study that was done for an agility. Actually, it's not an agility, it's a change of direction test, but it's usually uh, used as agility. And here you can see that the uh, group that received external focus instructions were faster compared to internal and uh, control groups. And usually the internal and uh, control groups usually show the same performance. So, uh, that's something to consider. Oh, look at, uh, at this patient. Oh, oh, yeah, there it starts. I would like you to pay attention to her face. Because if you want to learn something, would it be much easier, much more uh, fruitful if what you do creates some fun and then if you are being challenged, the challenge in this case, we provided her with an external focus cue, try to keep the cup in the water. And she was really challenged by this. And maybe if you see her performing the exercise, you may not be happy because uh, she's making all kinds of um, um, corrected movements. But again, as I showed you, as I told you before, performance is different from learning. So how can you determine learning? Well, that means that you have has to practice for maybe a week, maybe two weeks, and then check again. So don't be too quickly on correcting all the time. Again, something that I talk about back in a, in a few minutes also. Because we feel that motivation is crucial also when you think about ACL rehabilitation. And typically, and there's been some research on that, patients, uh, start to drop down in the motivation somewhere around four or five months. And as we know, as, as Hegel was also saying, the best result to get a good outcome after an ACL reconstruction is if you do rehab. Now we need to make uh, our improvements in, in targeting all these factors with high quality rehab. But it's not only that, it's also that we need to create an environment that is challenging and motivational for the athlete. And one aspect uh, that is important to consider is giving your athlete some sense of self-control of autonomy over the exercise program. And I'll show you some examples later. Because why would that be relevant? I think this is a very nice quote by Benjamin Franklin. 
if you think about the first line, tell me, and I forget, that could almost be, well, what you saw in the video with the golf. And maybe in traditional therapy, the second line applies. Teach me and I remember, but for how long? The third one, and that's the most powerful one, involve me, so involve the patient, and then you learn and you develop. And that's, I think, what we want to accomplish by uh, applying motor learning principles. Said something already about feedback. You look at common practice, and there's a lot of studies out there, physiotherapists alike, and here uh, coaches, they provide a lot, a lot of feedback. Now, if you allow your athlete to decide when they would like to receive feedback, it's far less than what typically a coach or a physiotherapist provides. Think for yourself now for a second. Would you like to receive feedback when, if you were doing a motor skill, uh, skiing or jumping or uh, what, whatever, would you like to receive feedback from your coach if you did something well? Or if the coach noticed something that you didn't do well? Think about your own preference and think about also how this might apply to your patient. Now, here we, we also applied the same principle in the, in the study. So we uh, had uh, handball players performing uh, an exercise program, and this was related to primary uh, prevention. And they were showing, uh, they were, were showing how, to, how to do the skill in the video, and then they were asked to repeat that. And the, the feedback that they got back is to show how they performed the task, as an overlay compared to an expert. And all they saw is the deviation from the expert. So we did not say anything about keep your knee over the toe. Our only instruction was try to create as much overlap with the expert as possible. And we compared that to an internal focus group. Now, look here, I took the, the variable knee range of motion, flexion extension, and the last bar uh, the gray bar, that's the most important one. So there was a baseline test and then there was a, a test again and another test right immediately after the test. And then there was a time frame of about a few weeks where they did not practice. And that's, that's the retention period. Remember when I said it needs to lead to relatively permanent changes. But on all three time frames, immediately post until retention, the group that had self-control over their feedback fared much better compared to the group that received internal focus instructions. Now, what do you think when an, when an athlete typically performs, let's say eight or 10 or 12 repetitions of a, of a task, um, whether it's a single leg squat or lunges or something, how often do you think an athlete would request feedback on, on, the, on the task? Well, we have quite a lot of data, and this is also work that my colleague Anna Benjamins is doing. But again, this shows the same trend as I showed you before. Athletes in the range typically ask in 10 to 50% for feedback on all trials completed. And if I go back to the, to the question, when would athletes like to receive feedback? 70% of athletes would prefer to receive feedback when a trial went well. So that means that 30% only has in favor of receiving an exercise in which they made a mistake. So think about, there's some research done on, on uh, gait training in, in physiotherapists and uh, on an average a physio physiotherapist was providing feedback every 14 seconds during gait training. If you apply the same math here that 70% of athletes or patients would prefer to receive back when only when it when a task is going well we may be providing feedback that's not really wanted by our patients and typically what is the type of feedback well that's also been studied quite a bit here you see and this is a motor learning study where they looked at baseline and then they did a series of trials and then they determined uh, retention, which is defined as the learning effect. And here you see when athletes receive feedback after good trials compared to a group who receives feedback after bad trials on the retention, which means 
does the motor learning behavior sustain over time? Those athletes that receive feedback after good trials score better. That's one aspect. But what does it do with self-efficacy? I don't want to talk too much about it because Dr. Eva Agerberg will follow me. But just to highlight here that if you provide feedback after good trials, you're also enhancing self-efficacy. And isn't that something that we all know already that's also important to improve our outcomes? So it's not only biomechanically that I talk about motor learning, but there's also a psychological aspect, yeah? We know that changes in the brain occur after an ACL injury, but we also know that how we say something to a patient or if we allow a patient to have some control over an exercise, it affects different brain areas. And in this study, they allowed athletes to get some control over the exercise order. And clearly here, there was more processing going on after the exercise in the group that had the opportunity to control which exercises they wanted to do. So you have more a more effective brain activity if you give your athletes some control over the exercise. Now, now to the final one I wanted to talk about, the constraint-led approach. What is that? I think it's a relevant uh, principle that we need to discuss. Because you need to realize that movement is nothing more than the resultant of the interaction of the triangle of the athlete, the environment, and your task. That dictates a certain perception action cycle, and the resultant is the movement. So this is important to realize because if you do your training and your testing in your physiotherapy clinic or your athletic training department, it provides you information only about that setting. It doesn't say anything about a transfer to the field. So think about this when you do return to sports testing or training. And within that constraint-led approach, you can manipulate certain third aspects. You can add cognitive load. You can change the motor part of the task. So I mean by that, you can do a sprints at 100%. You can do diagonal cuts. Uh, you can do jumping. And then the third part is the sensory part. So you can do that with uh, on grass, on artificial turf, on sand, uh, in the dark, in the light, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a lot of opportunities to manipulate those gauges to provide your patient with a sensory rich environment. And that typically conf confronts the brain with new challenges. And that is really important to enhance motor learning. So if you do the same thing over and over again, yeah, you get really good in doing that. But does that transfer to other skills? That's what you need to ask yourself. So a few examples here. So we tested some you know, young athletes on the field. And in this condition, uh, he was uh, doing an agility course. And at the moment where he uh, was approaching those dummies, a light of the smart goals lit up. And that was the indicator. That's where you need to score to. OK, he's wearing like a scuba diet. And I'll show you later what that is. So this was one condition. Then we only change the condition a little bit by placing two dummies in front of the goals. So it actually decreased the, the space in which he could score. And that was the only thing we, we did. Now, this is the test setup. So we wear, an, he was wearing an Accents uh, suit, uh, wearing uh, IMUs to measure the kinematics and we measured uh, time and et cetera, et cetera. But for today, for, I wanna focus on, on only this uh, aspect here. If you change one condition from one set of dummies compared to two sets of dummies, we saw a change in knee abduction, adduction, and not all, pay, not all athletes had the same pattern. So that's also something to, uh, to consider. We typically look at research and we look at mean values, but we need to consider that we are working one-on-one -on -one with an athlete. So an N is one design, uh, is I think something that we need to consider when we analyze our patient. And we can compare to the mean for sure, but not all people show the same movement behavior with the same conditions. That is something very important to consider. We always think that movement is a linear process. It's not the case. It's not the case. This is where self-organization is very different between people. Uh, it's never the same. So to sum up, I think 
uh, to contribute uh, to uh, to the ACL um, challenges that we're facing in light of uh, decreased performance, not patients not able to return to the pre-injury level, the high risk of second injury in a certain cohort, and also uh, the high risk relatively of uh, early onset of OA. Perhaps motor learning approach can also contribute to, the, to that by facilitating more optimal movement. And for that, you need a rich environment. So that's not only uh, strength training, which is obviously no discussion about it, which is important, but you also need to address other factors like uh, sensory, cognitive, and also the visual components. And if you have any uh, additional questions after this presentation, to feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to answer, uh, answer your questions. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ali, for a really a great presentation on this, uh, on this topic. I mean, um, we, have, we have been around a while. We know it's an important, uh, an imp very important area. And I think you showed very well how, how it interacts with many, many other aspects in dealing with patients, athletes. Um, maybe, could you maybe highlight something uh, so by the end is um, during rehab or training, uh, then uh, return to, to uh, sport phases is a, it's a matter of the, um, of the patient or the athlete developing his own strategies to, to master this situation. Uh, you have spoken uh, about um, a certain um, um, time of, of retention. Uh, can, you, can you develop a bit more there? Do, Okay, um, maybe some uh, some some other studies uh, in this direction. How long it takes to to master in average a certain situation, or maybe it's just too individual, and and we cannot mar much uh, argue about this. Yeah, yeah, very good question. And I, I actually there is there is a need for more research on it, but. What I, what my criticism on the motor learning uh, literature currently is, is that it's not reflective of what's done in a clinical practice, because uh, um, it's usually done in very high, highly controlled conditions, which is obviously what we need for standardization. But you know, for external validity towards practical conditions, you don't only do a certain exercise; you, you do a var variety of different exercises. Uh, so that the transfer from later, from research to the clinical application is still uh, there's still a gap, but in an attempt to answer your question, it really depends on the task. If it's and it depends on this on the baseline skill level of your athlete. Um, but learning can take uh, anywhere from a few days to a few weeks, uh, and of course, based on your uh, on your criterion. Uh, is, is it just for uh, basic motor skill or is it for highly advanced motor skills? And there you can also reach a ceiling, of course, if you have a professional athlete and if you want to learn them to improve a certain skill a little bit more, that may take quite some time because uh, they, they are already quite up there. But from baseline up, it, it's usually easier to acquire something. Yes, so I'm sure that uh, your group and other groups around the world will... Uh... Mm -hmm. We'll work on these issues, and uh, as you have said, uh, people can contact you and uh, maybe also use the the Sport Physio 2020 hashtag. So, Harley, thanks yeah. a lot for uh, thank for you, Mario, for inviting me. Thank you, and hopefully until okay. see you soon. Bye. Okay. So, bye bye. Bye.